everyone. Uh, good evening. Welcome on behalf of the How To Academy. It is wonderful to see so many of you signing in. I think you've made a very wise choice of what to do with your evening. You are undeniably in for a fascinating hour. Um, if the book that has inspired this event has anything to, or is anything to go by, this here is the book in my screen. It is Dark Matter, The New Science of the Microbiome. And I am delighted that we have with us its author, Dr. James Kinross. He is a senior lecturer in colorectal surgery and consultant surgeon at Imperial College London. And he is also a visiting professor at the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland. Um, and he has literally whisked out of surgery to be with us. Uh, Dr. James Kinross, thank you so much for, for being with us for this conversation this evening. The, the pleasure is 100% mine. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And I should say this is your first book. And um, there may be some, it's, you know, we, we don't know uh, out of the people who've signed in how much knowledge um, and how much people already know about the microbiome. But I'm going to start with the basics for those who don't know it, because we need to start there in order to carry on the conversation, I feel. Can you explain to us, just to start off, in simple terms, while it is far from simple, what is the microbiome? Well, I, I think it is simple, actually, and I think I think the, the the purpose of this story is to try and make it accessible. But the microbiome, at its most basic function, is a collection of microbes. So not just one type of microbe, like a bacteria, but also viruses, yeast, parasites that live together in a connected network. And a microbiome also describes all of the things that those microscopic life forms need to exist. And typically, a microbiome has um, an important what we call symbiotic function, which means that a microbiome has an evolutionary relationship with the organism that it lives on or within. Uh, and that means that it has important functions in determining how that organism lives and how they maintain their health and how they grow. So we have microbiomes uh, all around us. There is a planetary microbiome. There are microbiomes in just about every single animal that walks or crawls or swims in this on this glorious planet that we live in. But we also have them within us. So we have microbiomes within our gut. That's the largest microbiome. Uh, but we have microbiomes on our skin. We have them um, in our lungs. We have them any in in our in our sex organs, obviously. And we uh, really need them to be healthy. And that's really the story that this book is about. And it's called the new science of the microbiome. So what do you mean by that? It's just, I yeah. think, really important to start at these with these very basic questions here, because that's how we can understand why you wrote it and why it was important to write it now. Yeah. So I, it's a new science because for about the last 20 years, we've had to start reappraising our relationship with with microscopic life forms and what they mean for our health. And it's a new science because it was only around kind of the early 2000s that we, be we began to get the tools that we needed to, to really understand who is there and what they're doing. So that was through the advent of sequencing technologies that we could apply to, to complex networks of bugs uh, and also the other technologies that we needed to understand what they're doing. And it was a bit like 20 years ago, we discovered a brand new organ that we didn't know existed, right? And and the I've mentioned the gut microbiome. I'm a gut surgeon, right? So it's one that I'm obviously biased and most interested in. But but the gut microbiome is is really enormous. And in terms of its kind of metabolic functions, it's probably only surpassed by the liver in terms of its total capacity. So it, it was like a huge rediscovery. Having said that, you know, the ancients have always known that there were microbes with it. Well, that's not true. They've always known that um, that there were um, other microscopic life forms that were important for our health. But perhaps we can get into that in our, in our conversation. Mm. So you wrote this um, in a room, I think, in the hospital yeah. during pandemic, yeah. during the pandemic. How much was did that influence your writing of it and the way in which our yeah. relationship with the microbiome sort of changed in that time? For sure. So, I mean, I, I began writing this before the pandemic and the COVID pandemic completely reshaped mm. what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it. I, but I want to pick you up on kind of one really important point that you've raised, which is that we became fixated on this global catastrophe for very obvious reasons. You know, COVID was, was just horrific. It was a disaster. But 
But the point I'm trying to make is that actually, globally, we are existing, we are coexisting with a pandemic of non-communicable disease, which kills far many more people and disables, you know, a far greater number. And that is a pandemic of obesity. It is a pandemic of cardiovascular disease. It is a pandemic of immune mediated conditions that affect uh, our risk of allergy or asthma or immune mediated conditions of the gut, like inflammatory bowel disease. And at the center of that, all is the microbiome, right? So my hypothesis is that unless you understand that, you can't prevent that pandemic. But of course, you're trying then to explain that in the middle of a global catastrophe caused by a pathogen, right? So there are there are good and there are well, actually there aren't good and bad bugs, but there are pathogens that cause us harm. It's very hard to have a narrative that says, actually, hang on, not all bugs are bad, right? Actually, Microbes are not the enemy here. Comparatively, a very small number of them really causes harm or are transferable between humans. It's just that our understanding of our relationship with microbes is heavily biased towards those pathogens. And that's because until the sort of um, revolution, the industrial revolution and the revolution in antisepsis and sepsis that followed it, um, you were more likely to die of a pathogen. So the thing that was most likely going to kill you in the 1900s and the early 20th century unequivocally was a pathogen. You were likely to die of a pneumonia uh, or, you know, cholera or a gut infection, for example, or tuberculosis. Nowadays, you're not. You're much more likely to die, even in uh, a global pandemic of a pathogen, of a chronic disease. I found that absolutely fascinating. And I think um, listeners and viewers will just want to understand better how to get this balance right. Because you you write the pandemic reignited, as you've just said, a war on bugs, a war that started with germ theory 150 years ago and mutated into toxic misophobia, which is an irrational fear of germs and contamination. But this is a message that you're going to struggle, I think, to get out because we have this message now so firmly ingrained that we must you know, put hand sanitizer on that we must keep ourselves completely free from bacteria. So how, where's this balance that we get right? Is that completely wrong? Should we not be using those things? Yeah. So what I really want is if you're cooking a meal or you're going to the loo or you're, you know, <laughs> going to do an operation, wash your hands. You know, these things are important and they've saved lots of lives because they stop us transferring pathogens to, you know, from one human to another. And I'm not suggesting that we should roll in the dirt and that um, actually that's the better way of living, you know, not being hygienic. What I'm saying is that after the Industrial Revolution, and particularly after the Second World War, we started to live in what I refer to, or what I think of as like an anti-biocene. So, uh, you know, we, we think of, you know, it's like an epoch where actually uh, our industrial process has been to try and kill all known bugs dead. And what that has led to is the, the willful misuse of antibiotics at uh, such um, um, an overwhelming scale that it has completely shifted uh, our relationship with microbes at a planetary scale, let alone within a human scale. Now, I think there are other very important evolutionary forces that influence our relationship with our microbes. And I think what I'm trying to say in this book is that actually some of those are beyond our control and some of them are within our control. So for example, um, global conflict has really reshaped our relationship with microbes because it displaces people and opens up trade networks and it causes antimicrobial resistance and it damages our environment. Um, our, our use of medicines, so our complete and total reliance on pharma, on, on pharma industry to, 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 to maintain paradoxically, ironically, our our you know chronic diseases that I would argue are caused by our, our relationship with microbes breaking down are also affecting our microbes. But the biggest one undoubtedly is climate change. And what I'm saying in this book is because our microbiome physically and phys phil philosophically connects us to our planet's ecosystem and our, to the planetary microbiome, when that is being destroyed, ours is too. And effectively what we're experiencing is an internal climate crisis. And, and that's got nothing to do with how you wash your hands or when you wash your hands. It's about how we as a society conceptualize our relationship with microbes and what we really want to do to protect them. Can we go to, I was, I was going to come later to antibiotics, but it's a really yeah. obviously a hugely interesting part of this. Um, you, you know, you've just talked about the great risk that they cause to our microbiome. And yet again, it, I suppose it comes back to this question of balance that I'm keen to understand how to get that right, because you're not advocating 
to stop using antibiotics. So, you know, because we need yeah. antibiotics. So what is your solution? How do we care for, look after our microbiome and at the same time, you know, had the right amount of antibiotics w- when they're necessary? It's a really good question. I mean, I've just done an operation. I mean, literally, I gave antibiotics, right? My patient would have been at a significant higher risk of a wound infection and having a really bad outcome if I didn't. I prescribe antibiotics. I think what I would say in, in answer to that question is that, um, um, first of all, you have to think about who gets the antibiotics. And in North America, 80% of antibiotic use is not for humans, it's for animals, yeah. right? And that's because antibiotics were used as, anti- as, a, as, a, as a growth product, right? Uh, and then they they are used to maintain the health of livestock, which fuels our addiction to meat, basically, which is wholly unsustainable and, and perpetuates the problem. So the first thing is who's getting them? It's not always humans. The second is who's making them? Where are they making them? How, how safely are they making them? And what we know is that globally, antibiotic manufacturers don't do that very well. And antibiotics leach into our soil, they leach into our water supplies, and they're kind of everywhere because of it. The third uh, argument is that we unquestionably overprescribe antibiotics so that that's because quite often um, um, we uh, don't have any other better solutions sometimes it's because of poor education sometimes it's because we don't have precision tools that allow us to use the right antibiotic in the right in the right person and the British government knows this and they've got a national strategy trying to reduce unnecessary antibiotic prophylaxis sorry antibiotic use the final thing is when you get antibiotics. So, so um, because the microbiome is dynamic, it doesn't stay the same with us. We're not born with a microbiome and then it stays with us until we die. Mm-hmm. We're born with very few microbes and they grow within us as we grow. And they have very, very important functions in determining how we grow and the health of many of our organs, the brain being one of the most fundamental. And when you destroy the microbiome through inappropriate antibiotic prescription or unnecessary antimicrobial reliance or environmental contamination from antibiotics at those critical moments in your development, that's when the impact can be really dramatic. And, and, and you know, it's, it's troubling to me that, that we don't think about that more often. Mm. I mean, there is there is so much um, to ask you, and I know there will be questions from the audience too, and, and I'll sure. come to those in about half an hour. But you mentioned so you mentioned antibiotics. You also mentioned climate change, and generally, yeah. you talk a lot in the book about twenty first century living. One of the things you say is it's causing our airways to close, our skin to flake, our joints to swell, our guts to bleed, um, and that is so much down to sort of toxins in the environment, climate, man made climate change, and so you might forgive people for thinking like with much to do with climate change, you know, a feeling of helplessness basically starts to come over. You think, can, how can I change this? But, you know, your book does have lots of sort of positive advice. Yeah. So it's it, this this is a man-made thing. These are huge things happening, climate change. But you're saying, you, you know, you are hoping to empower your sure. reader, aren't you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so um, this book is about reframing how we think about all of those environmental drivers that you've just described. So environmental toxins that we meet cause disease. And it's about actually what this book is. It's a call to arms, really. It's a call to prior to prioritize our microbiome and actually to protect it. And to protect it, particularly at key moments in our development, because if you don't, I would argue that people become you know, disadvantaged in quite significant and fundamental ways later in their life. And the most important thing about the microbiome is Can that I just can... quickly ask you those key yeah. moments? Sure. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. So during um, gestation, so the maternal microbiome, dads, don't worry, your microbiome is really important too. But, you know, mums, the mum, the maternal microbiome, I believe, my personal opinion is, is that it is very, very important in the development of that unborn child. The second is in early life, so from the ages of three to five. So in the minute of born, the minute you're born to about the age of three to five, your microbiome evolves and forms an adult construct at around that time frame. And then probably the next stage is around puberty. That's super important. After that's pretty stable, uh, actually, as you ca- go into adult life until you start to age. So when you hit your around the 70 mark, it's kind of debated as to exactly when it starts to change. It changes again. And so broadly, people at extremes of life, the very young and the very old, they are the most vulnerable. They're most vulnerable for pathogens. They're the most vulnerable for lots of things that cause harm, right? But but equally, they're, they're at the most risk of having, you know, 
you know, detrimental changes to their to their microbiome. Sorry, I interrupted you. you no. sort of, the bigger yeah, picture. So, mm. so, what, so what I was trying to say is that this book, I hope, is a positive thing. It's about saying, look, actually, you really can change your microbiome and you can do it really positively. And this book is full of examples, actually, of where that's happened. Uh, and it's full of examples, both about individual things you can do, but also things that you can do at a country or national level. Right. So uh, a country na national level example would be to ban the use of antibiotics as antibiotic growth promoting factors, which we've done in Europe. And it's been really successful. And they've done it in Denmark. And lo and behold, it makes a huge difference to the, the, the distribution of antimicrobial resistance genes. You can do lots of things to your diet and the way that you eat and the way that you fuel your microbiome. And we, I'm sure we'll talk about that. And I'm sure you'll have questions about it. But effectively, de-westernizing your diet makes really big changes to it. You can ensure you're vaccinated. If you're vaccinated, you're much, much less likely to take antibiotics and you're having a precision strike on bad actors and it protects the rest of the microbiome because of it. Um, and ultimately, of course, if you're really sick and your microbiome is perhaps part of the reason why you're sick, you can have a fecal transplant now, which, uh, you know, is something that, of course, we've been doing for thousands of years and has slowly been rediscovered and reimagined into a modern therapy.